I told you a little bit about me. I am from uh, Johnson City, Tennessee, and I'm going to take my jacket off. I told him earlier that I will sweat like crazy. Seems like the more nervous you get, the more you sweat. I was talking to a brother back there at the back, and I said, uh, if there ever comes a time that I do not get nervous when I'm fixing to preach, I'll quit. It's not because I get nervous because of the people. I get nervous because I'm held accountable for the message that I deliver. And if something I say turns somebody away from church, that's all on me. That's why I get nervous. This is holy ground. And it's an honor to be back here. A lot of times I don't stand behind the pulpit. I, I don't feel worthy. A lot of times I get down in the front and uh, I try to stay back here and not scare you all and get down so close to where I'm spitting on you if I get excited. But... Uh, we did come up from Johnson City, Tennessee. Uh, I originally grew up in a small town called Duffield, Virginia. My wife is actually from Johnson City. Uh, I moved over there for college, and we met, started dating, and then the Lord said that's the one. So I've uh, been happily married now. We got married September the 25th, 2012. I got it right this time, right? <laughs> um. I may go into my testimony a little bit if the Lord, uh, if the Lord leads me later. Uh, but right now, if you, uh, if you have your Bibles with you, if you would turn to, and I have never got confirmation as clear as I did this morning. Uh, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. I mean, uh, Pastor Henry hit on that this morning. And like I said, I have never, the Lord has never revealed to me that my message was correct as much as he did this morning. And that's, that's something I want to do. I want to always get confirmation and make sure that I'm doing the right thing according to the Lord's will. Uh, when you find that, if you don't mind, if, uh, if you're able to, if you would stand in reference to the reading of God's Word. I'm going to read uh, John 14, 1 through 3, and then jump over to uh, John 14, 27. Chapter 14, verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am ye may be also. And then verse 27 says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth I give unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I come before you as humbly as I know how, just asking that, that you would allow your message to go out and that it may be received as you would have it to be received. And Lord, hide me behind the cross. I don't want anybody to see me up here. I don't want to get any of the glory or any of the praise. I want all the glory and honor and praise to go unto you because you are the one that deserves it. I am nothing and less than nothing without your grace. I am just a vessel that is willing to do whatever you would have me do, Father. Just go with us the rest of this evening. Be with the message, Lord. Your will be done. In Jesus' sweet and precious name we pray. Amen. The main part that the Lord brought out to me is the first six words. Some of the most powerful words that I have ever read. And it comes from Jesus saying it. Let not your heart be troubled. This day and time, I mean, you, look, you watch the news. We don't have cable anymore because I'm tired of watching the news. But Facebook feeds, you'll, you'll get those feeds that say... This is happening in, in Israel right now, and they're bombing Gaza. And, and then you turn around and you see about all these planes that are crashing. The Bible says, let not your heart be troubled. Don't worry about that stuff. God's in control. He controls everything. He knows your uprisings. He knows your downsittings. He even knows your thoughts afar off. Before I was ever conceived in my mother's womb, He knew one day that He would call me to preach. He knows all this stuff before it ever happens. So those six words are what I really want to focus on. I mean, Jesus knew that the disciples were troubled. I mean, what all could they be thinking right now? They just found out that he was going to be arrested and crucified. I would be scared to death too. Some of the feelings they may have been going through, I couldn't imagine. Uh, 
two things that I think of whenever I think about a troubled heart are grief or unbelief and then fear. And he told us in verse 27, don't fear. Don't, let not your heart be troubled and don't be afraid. Some people may say, you know, why were the, why were the disciples feeling, why would he have to say this to them? The distrust would come in from the fact that they just found out that one of their own, Judas, was going to betray Jesus. Distrust, how, how could they trust the man that had walked with him, walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, was with him daily, and now he's going to betray him? Another thing they're dealing with is the anxiety of the fact that he was fixing to be crucified. Jesus was troubled too. And he sees it on the disciples' face and they have to see it in him. And we see it later on when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. I mean, he's praying so hard, agonizing with God to let the cup be passed from him that his sweat becomes his great drops of blood. But Jesus isn't dealing with sinful anxiety or anything. He's not dealing with any kind of unbelief or undue measure or anything like that. A way I like to look at it, an analogy I heard was Jesus, the troubles that he may have been going through are merely like, I mean, just shaking around a bottle of water. This water is clean, pure. I mean, you can hold it up and look at each other through it. There's not a blemish in it. Clean water. But then when you look at the stuff that we go through, we have sin in our life. I mean, it's kind of clear, but when we get agitated and you shake us up, look how nasty it gets. This represents sin. The dirt, the filth. Who did Jesus spend time with? The sinners. That's who He came here to save. He came here to save the lost, the sinners. is who He came to save. So our life, our problems, our anxiety is just like the bottle of water that has sediment at the bottom. And when you stir it up, something comes in. There it goes. All the filth comes out. Your sins will find you out. They will find you out. What's a cure for anxiety? He actually gives us a cure over in Matthew 6, verses 25 through 34. And this is a verse that I've had to turn to many times whenever I've felt down, not knowing where to go, was panicking, something that came up. Verse 25, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought of your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than remnant? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? If a bird is taken care of by the Lord, what are we to complain? He's taking care of us. A saying I like to say is people say, how are you doing today, brother? I'm doing fine. You know, I'm above ground. I'm blessed. And the guy back home at my home church, you'd ask him, he'd say, how are you doing today? And it's funny, he has the same name that my dad does. His name is David Kelly, and we call my dad Dave Kelly. He said, how you doing, Brother David? If I was doing any better, there'd be two of me. And trust me, the world couldn't handle two of him. <laughs> Verse 27, Which of you, by taking thought, could add one cubit into his stature? And why take ye thought of remnant? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? That's what we run into a lot of times. 
our faith will run out. We think, where's God at? Where's it? Why is he letting this happen to me? Where is he at? He's where you left him. If you turn your back on him, that's your own fault. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll go with you always, even until the end of the world. And then he seals it when he says amen. God, God's promises are yea and amen. You can take that to the bank. I promise you that. I told him this morning in Sunday school, when this world's on fire, I'll stand on the word of God. This is something that will never, ever, ever be destroyed. This is the living word of God. It's not in the past tense, it's in the present tense. This, when you read it today, you'll get one thing, you can read it tomorrow, you get something completely different. This is not a dead book. We do not serve a dead God. My God's not dead. My God is living. And my God is not going to tell me to go out here and kill somebody for His name's sake. I don't really want to get off on this. But I can't help it with what's going on in the world nowadays. We have these Muslims out here that are saying, God is saying, kill you. Your God may be saying that, but the God I serve is a merciful God who loves me, loves you, and died for everybody that they may be saved because He don't want to see them go to hell. That's our own choice. If you choose to reject God, that's between you and God. You cannot come to His salvation until He reveals unto you that you're lost. But once He shows you that, if you reject Him, that's on you. September the 25th, 2005, in a little church called Burke's Union Primitive Baptist in a small town. Well, it's not even considered a town. It's a community of Blackwater, Virginia. When I was 17 years old, I felt the knock on my heart. And I had been running from the Lord for a while. But I got up. And I could feel. I could feel hell just right at the bottom of my feet. And the Lord said, you've got to move. This is your last chance. I took one step out in the aisle and He carried me the rest of the way. It was about 12.01 on this side of the altar, right beside where they take communion. I received the Lord as my personal Savior. Let me tell you something. I wouldn't trade it for nothing. I wouldn't take back one single day that I've spent with my Heavenly Father. I wouldn't take a million dollars for it. You could not get me to turn my back on Him. He's brought me from too much. I was addicted pretty much to alcohol by the time that I was 19 years old. It was almost every other weekend we were going out and drinking. God brought me from that. I had earrings in my ears at one time. God said, take them out. I took them out. I cleaned myself up. I used to not care. But once Jesus gets a hold of you, whoo, it's a totally different feeling. And it's something that I will never let go of. I didn't mean to get off on that tangent. I tell you what, you've got to obey the Lord. When He tells you to share something, you've got to share something. Verse 31, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall ye eat, or what shall we drink? Or withal shall we be clothed? For after these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and His righteousness, and all things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Don't worry about tomorrow. You're not promised tomorrow. All you've got is today. Who's not to say that when you walk out the doors of this church, you may not ever make it home? I'm not trying to scare you or anything. That's just simple facts of life. Whenever it's your time, it's your time. There's nothing that you or any doctors can do to add anything to it. It's all up to God. It's all in His hands. So don't worry about it. I like to pray, Lord, Your will be done, and then leave it alone. Don't pick up that burden and carry it back with you. That's not what He wants you to do. That's a cure for anxiety. Just don't don't worry about it. Don't, don't think about it. 
Leave it in God's hands. If it's meant to be, He'll make it be. And that's, that's the same thing I've had to remind myself about, about actually coming down here in this situation. I've prayed and I've prayed and I've prayed. My wife has prayed. She's even sent me text messages saying that the Lord told her two words. Go and bail for her. Tell me that ain't a sign. I shared this with them last night. There have been four job opportunities that I could have had in the ministry. But God said no. He said no because there is a yes that's fixing to come through. I had a lady that I work with. She said, don't give up hope. Something's fixing to break through. Something's fixing to happen to you. As Jessica, as soon as we pulled in, we met Chelsea, we met Henry. They kind of walked off. I said, well, what do you think already? She said, let's pack up and come on down here. When we first walked in this church this morning, the feeling of love, it's obvious. You all have an open heart, a loving heart, and we appreciate the way you all have welcomed us in. And we appreciate this opportunity. Something that'll, that'll help you deal with anxiety is think back about some, some stories in the, in the Bible. You think about the three Hebrew children. You know, they're fixing to get thrown in a fire. I mean, if one of us sticks our hand on the stove, it's going to burn us. But three Hebrew children are fixing to be thrown in a fiery furnace. What'd they say? Our God will save us if He wants to. We know He has the power to. If you got thrown in jail, could you be praying at the midnight hour? Paul and Silas over in Acts chapter 16, they prayed. And what happened? A man got saved. The gates opened, shackles fell off, they walked out, went to a man's house, and got saved. He got saved. So when you think that you're in a bad situation, think about what they did. They left it in God's hands. They knew that He was able, He was capable of taking care of them. Job, whoo man, what a great example to live your life by. His wife said, curse God and die. What did he do? He prevailed. I don't know how many chapters long Job is, but the whole time it seems like the man's in a pickle. His entire time that we hear about him. But he rides out the storm. And what happens? He gets double what he lost. There's some more scripture I want to read real fast. It's in Romans. It's the power of God's love. Romans 8, 28. It's just an eye-opening way that, that you can see the glory of God and His love. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose, for whom He did foreknow and also did predestine to be conformed to the image of the Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom we did, or who he did predestine, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, we've got the victory. If you read the back of your Bible, we win. We're on the winning team. There's an idea I have about a youth skit where you take, you've got a baseball player. He's coming up in the draft. He's fixing to get draft. You've got the devil over here and the worldly teams. But then you've got 
Jesus' team over here. They may not be the best looking players. They may not be the strongest players. They may not have the best batting average, but they're a consistent team. You look over here, and you've got a bunch of steroid users, pill poppers, alcoholics. they got women in and out of the dugouts and in and out of the clubhouse all the time, but yet they're offering him more money. You come over here with us, we'll give you a contract for, say, I don't know, three years, $50 million. The devil will use you until you're used up, and then he'll just throw you out. He's not there for you. But yet we come over here, God says, you know what, I'll give you an eternal, an eternal contract. You can play for my team from now on. What's the best way to describe eternity? From here on. Why would you not join a team that's going to guarantee you victory for the rest of your life? A more consistent team will win more often than a team that might be filled of good players. I don't know if there's any New York Yankee fans in here. If there are, I'm sorry if I step on your feet. But the Yankees get all these big players. They buy their trophies. I hope I didn't step on anybody's feet. <laughs> I'm a Braves fan. And one thing about the Braves, they let you down every postseason. But you still got to stick with them. And one last thought that the Lord laid on my heart is about peace. Philippians 4, verses 5 through 7. Actually, I think I'll start up at verse 4. One of my favorite words in the Bible is rejoice. If you can't rejoice in your salvation and be happy in your salvation, laugh and have fun in the Lord, then what are you going to have fun in? All this other stuff is temporal. It'll wax away one day, but God is forever. He's the beginning. He's the end. He was here before the foundation of the world. He's here now. He'll be here when all of us are gone. There's no end in sight for my God. These other ones, like I said earlier, they're serving a dead God. We're serving a living God. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. That must be important. If he says the word rejoice twice, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. He's coming soon, folks. The Lord's coming soon. I've heard that my whole life, but it's closer now than it's ever been. We see stuff all the time. Jessica likes to joke around a little bit, and every time we see something about a sinkhole, she said, we're just going to end up getting swallowed up. That's how it's going to end. We're just going to get swallowed up. There's something always happening. And everybody's like, oh my goodness, what could this be? It's signs. The Lord's coming soon. Get right before it's too late. Be careful of nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's the peace that we can have in salvation. You know, before I was saved, I was afraid to go to sleep at night. Once the Lord revealed unto me, that I was lost. I was afraid to go to sleep. I didn't have peace. I couldn't eat. I was miserable. As soon as I got saved, I slept like a baby that night. It was like the weight of the world was just lifted off of my shoulders. There's no greater feeling than to know you've made the best choice in your life as accepting Him as your personal Lord and Savior. I went through a class... And I'm not knocking on any denominations or anything, but I went through a class at a Methodist church when I was around 12 years old. They said, you go through this class and you say this prayer, you'll be saved and you'll be baptized. I thought I was saved. I was 12 years old. I'm saved. Long about the sixth grade, we had a traveling evangelist. He's very well known. He was very well known back home uh, he went to be with the Lord now, though. His name was Mike Jenkins. Came to my middle school. 
and said, uh, if you're lost, say this prayer. I said this prayer with my buddies. And uh, he said, if you said this prayer and you mean it, come up to the front. They got up. I followed. Thought I was saved then. But that morning, September 25th, 2005, as long as I live, I will never forget that day. The Lord said, you are lost. This is the last chance. I've been telling you and telling you and telling you that you were lost. You've not been saved like they've told you you were. It's time to get saved. That morning, I truly did get saved. I didn't follow no friends. I didn't have to take any classes. I took that first step. He saved me. He carried me the rest of the way and finalized it. That's how the Lord saved me. He carried me. And He's been carrying me ever since. I can do nothing without Him. He is my everything. I love Him with all my heart. I wouldn't trade a single day. I wouldn't go back to my old ways for anything. It's not worth it. It costs too much to be a sinner. I don't see how some of these people do it. $25 for a peel in a back alley. I can't afford that. $25 will feed me for a whole week. I mean, I'm cheap. I, I go to work and I'll eat the same sandwich five days in a row. It don't bother me one bit. But these people are, are throwing money away. And what runs all over me is people that have potential. They have so much potential. They could give so much. But yet they throw it all away on something just for a little while. You know, those drugs only last you for a little while. Eventually, the bottle runs out. And what are you doing? You're searching for another bottle. You will not find any rest in the bottle. Trust me, I've been there, I've done that, I've got the t-shirt. I've done it long enough to realize alcohol is not an answer. Alcohol is nothing but a money pit. It's nothing but sin, and it'll lead you straight to hell. That's exactly where alcohol is going to lead you. The same way with drugs. The same way with all this other stuff that can get in the way of your relationship with God. Anything that comes between you and God is sin. Anything that you put in front of Him is sin. God is supposed to be the center of your life. Church, that's what we need to get back to. There's so many people that have so many other distractions that they let get in the way. I shared it this morning and, and this is part of my testimony and, and uh, I feel led by the Lord to share it again tonight. Growing up, I started playing baseball when I was six years old. thought I had a future in it. I was left-handed. Coach said, you've got potential. You could be a pitcher one day. I didn't play my seventh grade year. Too busy with other things. My eighth grade year, it's time I'm going to play baseball again. I play baseball the rest of my high school career. My coach said, son, you could be a good pitcher. You may not be the fastest, but you throw a lot of junk pitches. He, my dad used to joke around, my coach did too. He said, there's the use of seeing fastballs up here in the 80s and stuff from all these other boys, and you come in here throwing a fastball at 62 miles an hour. They're swinging three times before the ball ever gets there. Well, the Lord led me to this college, a little small little college, 611 of us, stuck down in between two mountains in eastern Kentucky, a little private school called Alice Lloyd College. Called the coach. I said, I'd like to try out. He said, we have open tryouts when school starts. I said, Coach, I don't have time to wait till then. I need to know now. I have a full ride to a community college without a baseball team. If you'll give me a spot on the team, I'll come to college up there and play for you. He said, all right, come on up here. We're having a camp. So I go up, and I get down beside my parents' vehicle, and I prayed, and I said, God, if you want me to go to this school, you let me know by letting me do good. If I do horrible, I'll walk away and not ever worry about it again. If I do good, this is where I'm going to school. I got out there, and they wanted me to warm up. And they said, act like you're going to do a pickoff to third base. 
So I act like I step off the mound. The guy's over here. I go to throw it. He's over here. Ball goes over there. I was embarrassed. I got up there to pitch, and the coach said, throw a curveball. Where do you aim it? I said, I don't aim it. I just throw it. And this is not anything on me. This is, this is all God. He said, aim at my head. I said, I'm not aiming at your head. He said, aim at my head. I said, coach, if I hit you, I do not get a spot on the team. I know this. He said, aim at my head. I throw the ball square at Coach Cornette's head. And the catcher, he's over here batting left-handed. The catcher catches it over here off the plate. He says, Coach, I've never seen a ball break that much. That was God. That was his confirmation. Out of 25 pitches, I threw 22 strikes and three balls. I said, all right, God, this is where you want me to go. I'll go. But then what happened when I got there? I done this. I got here. I pitched so good that they just had to have me. You know, it, it was nobody else. It was me. I've done this. Then I got to thinking, well, should I red shirt and hold back this year and try to get stronger, or should I just go ahead and play? I ask everybody but God. I give myself all the glory. I give myself all the praise and forgot to ask the one that got me there. I played this fall season. The last game we had, we had a practice the next day after the last game. There was a boy, there was a senior, and he came up behind me and tripped me. And I landed on a slate rock. The rock went in the corner of my elbow and shattered into about 20 or 30 pieces up into my elbow. The doctor had to go in and remove part of my elbow bone because of this. Why? I put baseball before God, and then I took all the credit. He said, if you want to do me like this, I'll take it away from you. Young folks, I want to talk to you all tonight. Don't put anything in front of God. You might end up losing it all. If you put something like sports... Or anything, it don't have to be sports. It could be anything else. A boyfriend, a girlfriend, video games, doing this, doing that. You put anything else in front of God. He has the power, the ability, and the authority to take it away from you. And you'll have nobody to blame but yourself. I blame myself because I lost my baseball career out of stupidity. Because I wanted to take glory for everything that God has done. That's why today I stand before you, nothing that I've done, only God. It's all because of Him that I'm here today. Happenstance, I got on the internet, saw you all had an ad, sent in the resume. I just said, Lord, your will be done. Next day I'm sitting at work, my phone goes off. We have to lock our computers before we get up. I locked my computer and ran. I ran out in the hallway. Pastor Henry. And now I'm here by the grace of God. And I appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate the way you all welcome to sin. It feels like home. Just like home. They welcome you in at home. You all welcomed us in here. And we truly do appreciate it. And I, I say this, and I, I'm not saying it because I don't mean it, because I do mean it. Y'all, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I love you. I do. It's only Christians that can tell somebody that they've met for the first time, I love you and truly mean it. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. I'm going to be transparent. I want to be able to communicate with you all with all transparency. He said we're going to have a meet and greet later. Ask me anything you want to. Aubrey already knows that. He already asked me what my favorite food was. I told him I'm Baptist, so I like fried chicken. But we do appreciate the opportunity. Um, appreciate you all letting us stand before you. Appreciate the word of God.